So in Matthew 10, there's, there's actually a lot, of, a lot of things to cover. It's kind of a long chapter. So I'm not really intending on getting too heavy and too deep into any one particular subject. So just kind of stay with. We're going to touch on a lot of little things. It's just sort of the way that this chapter goes. But let's go ahead and get started right here in verse number 1. The Bible reads, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, we've already been reading about this, of Jesus Christ doing these things. Up to this point, we see the miracles, a lot of miracles that Jesus has been doing. He's been healing all kinds of people all the way up to this point. At this point in Matthew chapter 10, <clears throat> he calls his 12 disciples, and now he uh, endues them with the same power that he has had in healing people, casting out devils, even raising the dead. He sends them out to go and do all of these works in a little bit, uh, a little bit later in this chapter. We're going to see that. Now, these are special powers, special abilities that are given to the apostles at this time. Not every believer had all of these gifts of being able to do these things. This isn't something that automatically came upon everybody who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There were specific people who were given these abilities. And the reason why I'm even making a point out of this is because you've got the Pentecostals, you've got people who will tell you today, oh no, every, you know, if you're born again, you're going to have this gift and that gift and this gift and you're going to be able to do all these different things. That's not the case. That's not the way it was back then. It's not the way it is today. Okay. One of the reasons for having all of these different things that they were doing is that they were proving the ministry of Jesus Christ. So when someone comes along claiming to be the Son of God, okay, claiming to be God in the flesh as Jesus Christ, that's a big deal. This is, a, this is, this is a, like a one-time event, basically, throughout history. There's been many prophets. You've had Moses, you've had Elijah, you've had all kinds of people throughout history who have been bold preachers for the Lord, who have been instruments used to give us the word of the Lord. People who have heard directly from the Lord. But the Son of God is different. Okay, God in the flesh come to this earth. It, it, you know, of course, it just makes sense that He's going to come to this world doing all manner of things that no one has ever really been able to do, ever. And just, and just so much more of it proving this, I mean, just beyond any doubt with many in fallible proofs, you know, not only that he rose again from the dead, but just that he is the son of God. Truly, this is the son of God, that even, even the, the, the soldier that, that was participating in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was able to say, wow, this really is the son of God. This really was the son of God. I mean, that, that's how much power and authority and, and just the works that Jesus Christ is doing. He gave this to his apostles as well. Why? Because they're making sure that the word is going to be spread abroad far and near and that the whole world will know that the Son of God has, has been to this earth. I mean, just, just unequivocally. That's the purpose for all of this stuff, in addition to many other things, right? I mean, just the, the, the concept of being healed and, and, and what that symbolizes with their soul being, being saved, right? Um, but, the, you know, there, obviously there's a, lot, there's a lot of reasons and a lot of learning and teaching we could get from all these healings. But ultimately, you know, one of the reasons people say, well, why isn't that going on today, right? Why, why was it so much back then and not, we're not really seeing this stuff right now? Well, the main reason is because he had to prove his ministry. And there was also a transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, which it's not like the entire law is gone, but there definitely was some changes. I mean, they're not doing, we're not doing animal sacrifices anymore. So when he changed the priesthood from the Aaronic priesthood to the, the priesthood of the Melchizedek priesthood, there had to be some changes in the law. And again, if you're going to come and do those types of things and change things, you got to prove 
who you are and that you have the authority to do these things. So all of these various um, miracles and the power of the Holy Ghost were used as just showing people, demonstrating that authority, that he's completely operating under the power of God. So that's the, that's the purpose of it. The cool thing here is that he's, he's given this power now unto his apostles to do that much more work. It's now instead of one person being able to do this, he's got an extra 12. Um, and obviously, he's getting, you know, even more people end up getting these powers too. But right now we see him in doing his apostles with that. Let's keep reading here. Verse number two. And he names off the 12 apostles. Verse number two and three. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labias, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, the one I'm just going to focus on here real quick is Simon, the Canaanite. And I just want to point this out because people get so hung up on the Jews just in general and how special they are and how important they are and everything else. And did they have a place that was special with God? Yes. As a, as a nation, yes, they did. But you know what the Bible teaches that's the most important thing, way more important than, than being physically descended from anybody is that of what your spirit is, of being a child of promise, being born again being a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That is what God is ultimately always emphasizing throughout the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. It, it really, you know, God doesn't care about the lineage as much as he cares about the soul and the belief and the faith. That's what he cares about. Now, he chose a people to use and he made promises unto Abraham and to Isaac, and to Jacob, and he had to keep those promises, and that's what he ended up doing. So um, I don't want to get all into that, but I want to, you know, there's a reason why the Bible says Simon the Canaanite. Everyone else that lists off, it, it, you know, some people have, you know, maybe more than one name, and it, and it might mention that here, but it says Simon the Canaanite, and Simon the Canaanite, this list is also in Mark, I believe it's Mark chapter 3, where it's basically, essentially the same list is given here, and it says the same exact thing, it's Simon the Canaanite. So it's making a point to say that Simon was a Canaanite. Uh, keep your place here in Matthew 10, but flip forward to Matthew chapter 15. And the reason why this is being pointed out, I believe we're being told that, you know what? You know what Simon was? He wasn't a Jew, he was a Canaanite. Now, he was a believer. He was inwardly a Jew. He was inwardly of the, child, of the stock of Israel. He definitely was chosen to, to, to follow Jesus Christ, to be an apostle. He was given these powers. But the Bible says that he was a Canaanite. Now, some people try to say, well, that just means because he came from the land of Canaan. Well, where was the land of Canaan? That's what Israel came in to possess the land of Canaan. Then you just call everybody a Canaanite and it doesn't make sense anymore. I mean, it really doesn't. That, that would make zero sense. And why would it focus just on Simon? Why would nobody else say where they're from if it was just talking about, well, he's just from that region over there? No. Simon the Canaanite is given there because he was from Canaan, but meaning he was a... Uh, you know, he was not a Jew. Look at verse number 22 of Matthew 15. We're going to see a woman here in verse number 22. The Bible says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So we're going to see how Jesus responds to a woman from Canaan. That's of Canaan, a Canaanite woman. Verse number 23, But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Verse 24, But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So a Canaanite woman, Jesus is specifically saying, she's not of Israel. So why would he be talking about a Canaanite woman being not of Israel, but then Simon the Canaanite somehow is physically of Israel? That wouldn't make sense. It's the same book. It's in Matthew. I mean, it's only a few chapters later. 
it's obvious he's talking about Simon being of Canaan, just like this woman was of Canaan, and she was not of the house of Israel. Now, she answers him, you know, of course, in the story and says, you know, hey, he, he says, it's not meat to give that which is given to the children unto the dogs. So he's basically referring to her as a dog, and she says, yea, Lord, but, you know, the dogs eat of the scraps that the, that the children leave under the table. And, he's, and he says, okay, you know, for this saying, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. You know, she, he, he answers her prayer. He says, you know, she has great faith, and, and he still heals her. And um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in getting into, you know, why did Jesus, why was he sent unto Israel? Why did he not go unto the Gentiles? We're not going to get way deep into that tonight. But the fact is, he did come unto his own. And his mission field was to go to the house of Israel. And that's what him and his disciples spent their time doing. But then after the resurrection, they were sent out into the whole world. So they're sent out to preach the gospel to every creature, everywhere, and to go and minister to everybody, which has always been the plan that's prophesied in the Old Testament. Um, even people, even in the Old Testament, people can become of the nation of Israel by joining up and, and making the Lord their God and becoming one with the people there. And that, and that was acceptable. And that's what people have always been allowed to do is because God's not a racist. He doesn't care about the, the physical descendants and say, nope, can't be part of you. Know, it's, not, it's not a religion that just says, like a cult on a compound, saying nobody else is welcome. We're just going to sit and... No. It's always been... God's always wanted people to come in. His house is called a house of prayer, you know, for, for the whole world. That's always the way God has worked. But... Um, just to prove this even further, Simon being a Canaanite, you don't have to turn her, but going all the way back to 1 Chronicles in chapter 1, you see where Canaan came from, just the seed of Canaan came from Ham. Now, the children of Israel came from Shem. That's why, you know, when people say you're anti-Semitic, that Sem comes from Shem. And so you're like, you're anti-Shemitic. And the reason they say that is because of the descendancy of Israel from Shem, from that line. Um, whereas, you know, Shem was Ham's brother. And the Bible says the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, Put and Canaan. So Simon, being a Canaanite, was not Semitic. Simon was of Ham. Now, does that really matter? No. Why am I pointing out? Because some people want to make a big deal out of who's a Jew physically. And I'm just pointing this out, and I think the Bible points this out. I think God allowed for, or not even just allowed, but chosen a Canaanite to be one of the apostles to just emphasize the point that you don't have to be a Jew to be a follower of Jesus or to be some extra special person like physically descended from Abraham. Even John the Baptist was saying, you know, you know, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for God is able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. Right. It doesn't matter. He said, that, that means nothing. If God wants to, these rocks can be a seed of Abraham. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Repent. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what he wants. So here we see the same thing. You know, I, I just want to point that out, that nothing is in the Bible by accident. So calling Simon, Simon the Canaanite is in there just to demonstrate, you know, even though, yes, Jesus Christ came unto his own and he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, that was his job, that was his mission. It, it wasn't a total closed doors to everybody else. I mean, he still healed the Canaanite woman. He didn't just utterly reject her. She demonstrated her faith and then that was good enough and she was healed. As were other people. We already saw the, the soldier the centurion, right? He wasn't, he wasn't a Jew, but he was inwardly. Because that's, that's what matters. Let's keep reading. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So here he's given them the marching orders. 
as they're endued with power. And again, he makes this mention of, hey, don't go into the way of the Gentiles and don't go into any of the cities of the Samaritans. Now, what this is implying, what he's actually saying here is that if you go, you know, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, only go to Israel. So basically, Jesus Christ isn't even considering the Samaritans to be of the house of Israel. Now, when you read through the history in the Old Testament, Samaria used to be the capital of Israel at one point after um, the split in the kingdom. So when the son of Solomon, Rehoboam, became king, then Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was, was ordained basically to be king of the, of the northern tribe, of the, of the, 11, of the, the 10 tribes, right? He, uh, they split off and Judah became one kingdom and then Israel was the other kingdom and the capital for a long time was in Samaria. Samaria is part of Israel. Israel historically was way more wicked than Judah was. Judah in general, obviously you had different kings ruling and reigning, but in general, you know, all the priests went down to Judah. All the service of the house of the Lord was in Judah. And when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, put up the, the altars unto the false gods and made the idols, the other believers were like, we're out of here. They went down to Judah to just be by, you know, worshiping the Lord instead of following the idolatry that Jeroboam set up. So that kind of strengthened Judah to, to hold the torch and to keep moving forward and um, just, you know, proclaiming the word of the Lord. And as a result of their wickedness and idolatry and everything else, the northern kingdom was um, conquered and brought into captivity well before Judah was. Ultimately, all of them were taken captive, but Judah went into captivity by Babylon much later than, um, than Israel was, was taken over by Assyrians. And what happened with Israel and the Samaritans, why I saw about Samaritans, is they got mingled in a lot more with, with, the, with their captors and with the Gentiles and with just, just other people. And kind of, they were already wicked to begin with. And then they sort of just lost everything at that point to the point where Jesus is saying he doesn't even consider them of the house of Israel. But Judah remained, uh, you know, somewhat pure even though they had sinned bad enough to be taken captive, and that's who Jesus is sending, uh, sending people to. So, and that's who he considers to be Israel. And that's also why, you know, like, you, you have people today, even any so-called Jews today, they're not going to be able to tell you what tribe they're from. They're not going to be able to tell you, you know, who's the tribe of Dan today? Where, where, is, where is the tribe of Zebulun and Naphtali? You can't find them. They don't know. They lost their genealogy. They lost their history. And you know what? Who cares? It doesn't matter. Another reason why we don't, we don't make a big stink about the Jews and worship the Jews and love the Jews because ultimately that doesn't even matter. And, and these people, a lot of people who claim to be Jews aren't even Jews anyways. And the only Jews that God cares about is the inward Jew. And Jesus here, he's, he's coming unto his own and he's fulfilling the prophecy. He came unto his own and his own received him not. And, and ultimately, they're going to be rejected and open up the door for, uh, for the Gentiles. So let's keep reading here, though. In verse number seven, the Bible says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. I mean, he's given them basically all power of healing. I mean, even to the point of raising the dead. That's amazing. Yeah. And look what he says at the end of this verse, verse 8. Freely ye have received, freely give. Now, this is an attitude that all Christians need to take to heart. You know, you receive something freely. You know what you've received today? You might not have received the gifts of healing and the gifts of raising someone from the dead, but you have received a gift. 
You received a gift of eternal life. And just as you freely received your salvation, you need to be freely giving by showing other people how they can receive that gift too. Hey, it, you, it didn't cost you anything. Therefore, but it's the greatest gift in the world. God's freely given something to you. You better turn around and, and then freely give. He's saying, I'm not giving you these gifts to just keep it inside, to hold it to yourself, to not do anything with it. I'm giving you this gift, so go out and do something with it. Go heal people. You have, you have the power to heal. Go heal people. You have the words of life. Go preach them to people. Verse number nine. He continues. He says, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves. For the workman is worthy of his meat. So as he's sending them out, he's enduing them with power, and he's saying, you know what? You don't even need to bring anything with you. You don't need to bring money with you. You don't even need, you don't need to bring two coats. Don't even bring shoes. He's saying, just go ahead. And what he's proving here is that he's going to take care of them. If you would just have faith and listen and obey and just do what I tell you to do, I'll make sure all of your needs are met. And the apostles, of course, follow his instruction and do that. And here's what he instructs them to do then in order to, you say, well, how are they going to eat? What are we going to do? If we're not even bringing any money with us, we're not even bringing extra clothing. Like what happens if it rains? What are we going to do? He says in verse 11, And into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, into, enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. Just find somebody that's saved. Find somebody who's worthy. So find someone who is already a believer. Find that person in that town and just say, Hey, I need to stay with you for a while. Can I stay with you? Sure, brother, come on in. And just... Stay there. And you don't need to go house to house. You just, just stay put. Whatever they're providing for you, eat it. Why? Because the workman is worthy of his meat, as he said at the end of verse number 10. Let them take care of you. Let other people provide for you. If you're going to go and preach the gospel, he allows you to live of the gospel. And just let people take care of you while you're out doing the work, because ultimately God's the one taking care of you. He says in verse number 12, And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. So you just, you go up, you meet someone. Hey, how's it going? You know, they're a believer. You preach the gospel. And if it's worthy, then you, could, you can stay and, and, you know, it'll be peaceful. And if not, all right, see you later. It's, it's that simple. Um... Keep reading here, verse number 14. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. You're saying, don't worry about it, right? Just, just, all right. And he says that house or city. So like even if there's an entire city, they're just not going to receive you. Just shake off the dust of your feet and move on. You don't need, you don't need to set up your, your megaphone, and get on the street corner and start yelling at everybody that don't want to listen to you anyways and tell them, you're all wicked sinners. You're all going to hell. Just move on. He says, well, find someone else who is worthy. Find someone else who is going to listen. Just go ahead and move on. Shake the dust off your feet. Right. Say, don't worry about it. You've given them an opportunity. You've given a chance. You talk to them. If they don't want to receive you, pff, no sweat off your back. Keep on going. And then he tells them in verse 15, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. In the city that does not receive you. Now think about this. Sodom and Gomorrah, in case you haven't known, I don't know how you, you come to this church, I don't know how you don't know. But even just in general, people know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah 
no matter what church you go to, if you know anything about the Bible, usually you've heard about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God rained fire and brimstone down from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah in the lands of the cities of the plain. Destroyed with fire and brimstone out of heaven. That doesn't sound very good for Sodom and Gomorrah. It doesn't sound like a place I'd want to be. It doesn't sound like it's going to be very good judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah if God rained fire and brimstone down on earth to destroy them. That doesn't sound like a very good judgment. So when you compare that judgment and saying, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be, you're going to wish you just, you just had to take the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah when you've refused the apostles that showed up to preach the gospel to you. You say, well, Pastor Rosen, why is that? I mean, we know how abominable Sodom and Gomorrah was and how wicked that was. Do you expect me to think that these cities that they're going into are all just as vile and reprehensible as Sodom and Gomorrah? No. But here's the thing. When you have the apostles and Jesus Christ all performing these miracles and just proving that ministry. See, we, you know, people don't have that today and all throughout history in general. You haven't had the added luxury of being able to witness these awesome miracles of God just, just boom, boom. I mean, they come to town and they're healing people and they're just doing all of this work to reject that. To just utterly reject that he says, you know what? Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have the opportunity that you had. Those people who, yeah, they've done abominable works. They didn't have the same opportunity that you because who did they have? Lot. We know Lot wasn't doing anything. He wasn't going around and preaching the gospel and doing what he's supposed to be doing. He definitely wasn't doing any miracles. And the Bible says elsewhere, you know, if the works have been done and you have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, it says they would have repented in dust and ashes long ago. Right. Yeah, the people there, if, if they would have at least, you know, earlier on had an opportunity to see all these miracles, you know, God said they would have repented. They, they would have believed. And that's why it's going to be more tolerable for them in that day than for the people who have been able to witness this. And that's why it's so, you know, it, it, I've brought this up many times just because it kind of blows my mind reading about this and, and, and trying to put myself in the story and think about what would life have been like during the time of Jesus Christ and you see these guys come to town. Let's say you lived in one of these cities that the apostles are sent into. And you're, you, you live there you know, you don't got telephones, you don't got the internet, you know, it's kind of a slower paced life in general. You're living in a smaller town. You don't have these metropolises the way that we have them today. I mean, even the big cities back then didn't, I mean, we've got like, you know, what, six million people or something in Atlanta metropolitan area. Like, I mean, it's just huge, it's massive. That's not the way, you know, these cities were that these people are living in in, in the, the area of Judea. Small towns, villages, cities, right? I mean, they're, they're in their local community and these guys come into town and, you know, they're preaching the word of God and all of a sudden they're just, they're healing people. And I guarantee you, you're going to know a lot more of the people in your community, a lot tighter, you know, closer knit. You know people, wow, this person was, you know, paralyzed. They had that accident 12 years ago. That, that they're walking. And just all the just 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 event after event after event, you start seeing this stuff. And Jesus said, "Hey, freely give." I mean, you know, you think they're going to be holding back? If you had the power to heal somebody, you're just going to be holding back and be like, "Yeah, I'm not going to heal that person." No, not no, no. Let's yeah, okay, maybe you. No, you know they're going out there, man. I mean, why wouldn't you? You just be healing and healing and healing and doing what, you know, that would, be, that would be what you were doing. That's what they were doing. And to be living in one of these towns and you see this happening, how could you not receive it? I mean, this, is re this isn't the fraud, charlatan, the people on the TV that have their paid actors coming in. You know, a town after town they go to, the same people getting healed every week. This is people that you know that you know they're really sick and you know they're really healed. I mean, you could, you could see this. It's not, this isn't a fake. 
this is reality. And, and to see all of that and to not just want to hear more and think about it and, and, and receive it. I mean, it's, it is so much easier. They had a lot given unto them to be able to witness these events. That's why it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than it is for them when, when they just have to shake the dust off their feet. And, All right. Gave you a chance. Verse number 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And, you know, this is the same for us today. We're sheep. The Lord is the shepherd, right? And we're sent out. There's a lot of wolves out there. There's some bad people in this world that are wolves that want to destroy. And they want to destroy things that are good and pure and, 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 and you know, especially Christian. But we have to go out in the midst of them. We don't run from them. We're not trying to hide from them. But we are going out and doing our work. And we know there's going to be wolves around. So therefore, because there's wolves around, he says, you need to be wise as serpents. You need to have a lot of wisdom. But harmless as doves. So we're not going out to start these physical fights and confrontations with the wolves. You know, the sheep's not going to win that battle anyways. Just, <laughs> just you know, we're to be harmless but be wise. Don't be foolish. Be, be smart about it. Verse number 17. But beware of men. And he's, he's giving another warning here. Jesus is sending these people out to do the miracles. And you think, well, why would they even need to, why would they need to worry about men? I mean, if you're doing all these miracles, aren't people just going to love you? I mean, you know the people who, who get healed are going to love you. Why would anybody not, why would anyone hate somebody who's just healing people? Well, why did they hate Jesus Christ? What did Jesus do? That's exactly what Jesus Christ did. Why did they hate him? Because they were evil people. Because they're wicked. Because they hate good. They hated Jesus. I mean, they, they, they hated him. They didn't like that he was getting attention. They didn't like that he was disrupting their power and, and, and their way of life and was thinking that, you know, they're going to lose their position and their money and their status. They didn't like that. So the only choice is to kill him. And people have not changed. There are still wolves. There's still evil people out there. And if you're going to do good and if you're going to do righteously, they're going to attack. Right. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. He's saying, you're going to be delivered up. They're going to arrest you. You're going to be brought before the authorities, all for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's what's going to happen. And here... We get a little bit into, and, I'm, and I don't want to spend too much time on this either, but I think he starts to prophesy even of his second coming. And, and I'll show you why in just a minute. So he says, beware of men. They're going to deliver you up. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be brought before governors. And all this stuff did happen in their lifetime, by the way. They faced this persecution in their lifetimes after Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and they went out and were preaching the gospel. They started to face all this persecution. He says in verse 19, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So he's saying, don't even, you don't have to premeditate and wonder, you know, when you stand before the people because you've been preaching the Word of God and that's why you're arrested. He said, don't worry about it. You don't need to come up with some plan of what you're going to say or excuse you're going to give. So don't even worry about it. I'll help you. The Holy Ghost is going gonna, is gonna to help you to speak and just, and just go ahead and speak. Uh, verse number 21, it says here, And brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved." 
And this is the part where I'm talking about, I believe he's talking about future events in this verse where you're going to be hated of all men, where the, the world, the, the whole world is turned against you. He says, you know, it's, it's going to get so bad that even family members are just going to be brother against brother. You know, uh, the children are going to be going against their parents, causing them to be put to death. Like, that's pretty, that's pretty bad. That's pretty extreme when you've got parents ready to, to, or children ready to put their parents to death. And being hated of all men. And he says, why? For my name's sake. Just for the name of Jesus Christ. That's enough to cause people to say, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, I believe God's word. It doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. Now, it makes sense to me. I've seen enough of it. I've read enough of the Bible. It makes perfect sense to me. But either way, that's the way things are going to be. He says, but if you endure to the end, you'll be saved. Look at verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Another reason why I believe, and this, I think this just proves that he's referring now to future events, because he says, till the Son of Man be come. He's talking about the second coming. His second coming, he said, you know what? When, when all of this stuff starts to happen, he says, when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. Now, notice what he says. When they pursue you in this city, flee you into another. Flee you into another what? Another city. He doesn't say, when the persecution comes, head for the hills and call for the rocks. Fall on us and hide us and, and go into caves and go to your bunker and, and, and get your food storage and get your vault and make sure that, that you've got your guns and ammo and everything tucked away and then you can just run and hide when they persecute you. He says, no, when they persecute you in this city, go to another one. Amen. Just go to another one. And he says, you know why? Because when that happens, you're not even going to have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man's come again. That amount of time that's going to be that extreme great tribulation, it's not going to be that full three and a half years of tribulation where, it's going to, where they're going to be just out to kill for that amount of time. He says, you're not even going to be able to make it through all the cities. You know, hey, the persecution is really heavy here. Just go to another city. You know what's in another city? Other people. You're not off by yourself. You're still going to continue. You should be continuing to do the work of the Lord until he comes. Don't just run and hide and have this plan to just, well, I'm just going to bug out. You know what? I'm not going to bug out. I might bug out to the next city. But I'm going to keep on just preaching the word of the Lord because that's what he told, that's what he told them to do. That's what he's telling us to do. It's the, it's the lost that are the ones that are going to hide in the, in the dens and the caves of the rocks to fall on us for, the, for the, the great day of his wrath has come. We're looking forward to Jesus Christ coming back at this, at this point, when we're, you know, at any point really, but... Um, when, it, when the persecution's coming, you know, real heavy, yeah, we're going to be, <laughs> come on, Lord Jesus, you know, we, we need help here. And he is going to come back, and it's going to be awesome. And, it, and that's why if you endure to the end, you're going to be saved. You're going to be saved physically, not spiritually. You're physically going to be saved because the, the people who are after you trying to kill you won't be able to kill you because Jesus Christ comes back before they have the opportunity to put you to death. So physically you're going to be saved. They won't have gotten you. Jesus Christ comes and you're going to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 24. The Bible reads, The disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. Again, this is another passage that so many people just need to, need to understand and need to realize because we live in this backward society where people want to look at, at churches like ours and people who preach the way we do going, oh, you're not, you're not very Christ-like. 
And their idea of being Christ-like is just nobody hates you. Everybody loves you. You're not causing any problems. No one's upset with what you say. You're just being, you know, politically correct and not bringing up taboo subjects and not bringing up anything that would offend anybody. And people think that that is what Christ was like. And it's so far from the truth. Because if that's what Christ was like, then how did he get crucified? He's explaining to them, hey, be ready for this. Because if they're calling the master of the, who's the master of the house? Jesus. If they called him Beelzebub, they're saying Jesus is the devil. That's pretty extreme. I mean, how much worse can you get than that? You can't. I mean, you're just taking God and making him Satan. You're taking two polar opposites and saying, well, Jesus is the devil. If they're calling Jesus the master Beelzebub, then what do you think they're going to call you? Oh, wait, though, but you're better than your master, right? You're better than Jesus, so you're not going to get anybody calling you names. You're not going to have anybody saying that you're of the devil. But, but see, modern Christianity thinks they're better than Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. They think they know better. They're more loving than Jesus, yeah. right? Look, there's a reason why Jesus was hated. Yeah. It's because he preached the truth. Right. He preached the truth. And a lot of people don't like to hear the truth. But Jesus tells his disciples, fear not. Don't be afraid. Look, it's coming. You see what they call me. You're going to see what they're going to do to me. But don't be afraid. And he says, there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. Their wicked deeds, they're all going to come to light. And these people who think they're doing God's service when they want to take their life. You know, a lot of these, a lot of the Jews that killed Jesus were thinking they're doing God's service. They're thinking, oh, this is a blasphemer. But you know what? They were wicked. Right. Not just because they put Jesus to death, which is obviously plenty to call them wicked for. They were already wicked. They had wicked hearts. They were wolves. They're already bad people that put Jesus to death, but they were pompous and fake and hypocrites, and they put on this front and this mask and this big show trying to make themselves look so holy and so spiritual and so righteous and trying to get people deceived into thinking, oh, they're a good guy. Oh, look at how holy I am. They were wicked. And you know what? All of their wicked deeds are going to be made known. If they weren't known around the time that they lived, they're all going to be known when they're standing before the great white throne of the Lord and they're judged according to their works. That's when everything is going to be uncovered because they're going to be standing there and they're going to be judged and going, okay, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. And you know what? Nothing that they said or did, no matter how well they tried to hide it, it's all coming out. Amen. It is all coming out. And I think there's going to be some people going, wow, I never knew that about that guy. Yep. Never knew it. There, there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. That's why Jesus is saying, don't, don't fear them. Don't worry about them. They're going to get what's coming to them. So don't even worry about it. And then he tells them in verse 27, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. You said, does it sound like Jesus wants you to keep anything secret that you've learned from the Bible? Oh, wait, no, we can't, we can't talk about these verses because it might upset someone. We can't talk about how getting married to someone after they've been divorced is adultery because it might offend somebody. We can't talk about how the sodomites deserve to be put to death according to God's law because it might offend somebody. We can't talk about, you know, drunkenness just being extremely wicked and, and actually removing a brother in Christ that's, that's a drunkard from your presence and not eating, not even having a meal with that wicked person because it might offend somebody. Jesus says, no, don't hide it. 
Look, what I've told you, you speak in the light. What you've heard in the ear, preach upon the housetops. Make sure everybody hears it. God does not want his word silenced. And I'm sick of these, even the, the fundamental Baptist churches out there that still believe right and are preaching right, but they censor their message. They don't want to put their sermons up on YouTube. They don't want to expose and just, and just broadcast the truth because they're afraid of what someone might say to them. They're afraid of people coming against them and hating them and them being on the news. You bunch of stinking cowards. Why don't you take the words of Jesus Christ and preach from the housetops? Whatever, whatever way you can, don't hold back. Don't hold back the word of God. Unless you, oh, do you think you're better than Jesus? I'm, I'm sick of people. That's one thing that, that attracted me to, to fundamental Baptist in, just to begin with is I've always just wanted to know the truth. A desire to understand and to know the truth. And I hate it when people want to just like feel like, well, I can only show you so much. Well, you know, Mm, you might not be able to handle this, so let, let me just... No, you know what? Just tell me the whole thing. I just want to know what's right. I just want to know... It doesn't matter if it offends me. Don't, I don't want you holding back for me. And you know what? We ought not to do the same thing. And, and, and check yourselves on this. Don't go thinking, well, I don't know if that person's going to want to hear the gospel. Because you look at their outward appearance. And you look at them and say, oh, well, that person will never... Listen. You know, why don't you just go to them and just preach the truth unto them too? And don't, and don't think in your own mind and, and come up with reasons why they're not going to want to hear this. Give them the opportunity to reject it. Don't reject it for them. I don't want people holding, withholding truth from me. I want to know it. Just tell me what's right. And when I finally got into a church that was able to just tell it like it is, what a blessing. Amen. You know what? Some people might not like it. Some people might just go away and never come back. Too bad for them. If they go away, it's not because... If the people come to this church and they leave because they don't like the preaching, it's not because I'm trying to get them to leave. I'm just trying to tell them as much as I can from the Scripture. And if you want to leave over that, your problem isn't with me. I'm just trying my best to do what Jesus said. What I tell you in darkness, that's speaking in the light. Oftentimes when I'm reading my Bible, it's dark. It's dark outside. I'm reading by, by artificial light. And that's oftentimes when I learn. And Jesus said, what I tell you in darkness, that's speaking in the light. What you hear in the ear, preach upon the housetops. That's what we're supposed to be doing out in the open. Don't hide your beliefs. Verse 28. And again, the warning not to fear. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So he's telling the whole point of this. So these, these, these past, however, five, six, seven verses, he's saying, Your job is to preach, it's the truth. You just do it, and don't worry what man's going to do unto you. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of the people who are going to call you names. He said, look, they're, they're calling the master of the house, Beelzebub. How much more are they going to call you? I'm warning you about it. I'm telling you about it. But I'm, the reason I'm telling you is I'm telling you also not to change. Don't withhold. Don't hold back. Just preach from the rooftops. And he's saying, why? Can they kill the body? Yes, they can. But he's saying, don't fear them. You know, you ought to be fearing the one who's able to cast both soul and body into hell. And who is that? That's God. So essentially what he's telling them here is don't fear man, fear God. It's a pretty simple concept, but you know, not complicated at all. But I just want to bring this up because there's a, there's a false doctrine out there and it's, it's, thank God it's not very prevalent. But these people who believe that, that Christians will go to hell for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. It's called the, um, um, the millennial exclusion. People are excluded because they weren't good enough Christians. And there's a, there's a pastor by the name of Joey Faust who, who 
wrote a book and, and preaches this damnable heresy. And they use verses like the one we just read here. And it's similar, the way that they, that, that they operate is very similar to the way that Calvinists operate. The way that a, a Calvinist will, will dig into a verse and find these implications that they want to show you, oh, this implies this and this implies this. It's not a clear statement, but they're going to try to make you think that it implies something and then try to just get your whole mind going that direction. But it starts off with implications, not with just clear verses. We know by so many clear verses that once you're saved, once you're born again, you have eternal life, eternal life, life that never ends. People in hell are always referred to as dead. They're not alive. If you have life that never ends, if you're never going to be thirsty, whosoever drink of this water shall never thirst. Right. Believest thou this? Well, I think people in hell are probably a little thirsty. Yeah, it's kind of hot down there. There's no water. Right. How am I never going to thirst, yet I'm going to spend a thousand years in hell? It makes no sense. Do I have to pay for my sins? Partially for a thousand years because what Jesus did isn't enough. It's wicked, but what they do is they take verses. And so we have so many clear verses that just, I mean, there is no way you could think that anyone's going to spend any time in the heart of the earth in a lake of fire because they just they didn't follow enough rules. Not found in Scripture. Not after you've already been have your, your sins atoned for you, paid for, bought, and cleansed. But they want to come up with this, with this Baptist version of purgatory. Purgatory is where your sins are being purged, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Jesus did that for me already. He already went to hell to purge my sins. I don't need to go after he's already gone, you know, a second time now for me to purge my own sins. Uh-uh. But they take a verse like this and they'll say, well, see, who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to Christians and he's telling them, you know, don't fear them that are able to kill a body, but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So instead of just looking at it and saying like, yeah, you need to fear God, he said, well, why would he tell them that they need to fear about God sending someone to hell if they're already saved, huh? Why do you have to worry about that? He's saying fear God. He's doing it in, 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 in an articulate way where he's saying, don't fear, hey, they're able to kill the body. God's able to kill both soul and body in hell. Don't fear man, fear God. Very simple verse. But they take things like that and they want to insinuate, oh, see, well, that must mean it's possible for them to have gone to hell then, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't have said it like that. They twist these verses. Does this say that if you don't proclaim the word of God from the housetops, you might go to hell? No. And when you read the whole context and stuff, that's ridiculous. No one thinks that unless you're just not saved. Unless you're some heretic, false prophet that's, that's lying in wait to deceive and just using cunning craftiness to, to try to trick people and to make them stumble at God's word. That's who does that type of thing. But I don't, again, I don't want to go too deep into that either. I'm already running out of time here. Let's finish up the chapter. Look at verse number 29. The Bible says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So he's again encouraging and telling them a reason why you don't have to worry. I know it's going to get scary. I know there's going to be people coming against you, and they're going to be you know, persecuting you and arresting you and beating you and doing all manner of evil against you. But don't be afraid. Endure. Go through it. Because God has you covered, is what he's saying. He's saying even, the bur even these little sparrows, God knows when one of them just falls down to the ground dead. God's aware of all of that. He knows everything that's happening in this world. You don't know when these birds are falling out of the sky and dying and just live their lives and, and they end up dying. You never even see them. God knows about every single one of them. And he says, 
basically he's explaining you're of way more value than a bird and God has the very hairs of your head numbered. Why does he say that? Because we don't care about the, the number of hairs, at least most of the people in here don't. I don't know. I'm probably going to start caring about that in a little bit. But, you know, we brush our hair and the hair falls out and you're just like, whatever. But God knows all the, all the number of hairs you have on your head. That's how much he knows you because he loves you. And he's saying, so don't fear. God knows so much about you. Don't fear. You're of more value than many sparrows. Verse 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Now I'd love to spend a lot more time just on these two verses. People who believe in work salvation love to quote these verses and tell you, see, you've got to do this and you've got to do that or else you're going to hell. Again, this passage doesn't say that you're going to hell if you're not doing good works. But that's what they always want to turn this into. He's saying, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. That's what he's saying. That's what, that's what the verse says. And if, you don't, and if you deny me before men, I'll also deny you before my Father. This isn't saying how your soul is going to receive eternal life. He's either going to back you up or he's not. This is in the context of being pressured, right? I mean, this is all in context. This, isn't, this doesn't just come out of nowhere. This isn't now all of a sudden we're going to talk about being saved. <laughs> They're already saved and he's warning, continues to warn them saying, look, you are going to go through these trials. You're going to go through hard times. Don't fear them. And that's why he's saying, you know what? And if you, can, if you continue and you can just confess Jesus, I'm going to confess you. So what do you have to fear? He said, but you know what? You should be afraid when the hard times come and then you start denying Jesus. Because then what's he going to do? When you're in that trouble, he's going to let you go through more of that. You know, it's just going to be worse for you. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It doesn't mean you're going to hell. It never says anything about any of that. The whole point is to say, you don't have to fear because I'm going to confess your name before the Father. You're confessing me. You're doing what I'm telling you to do. You're doing what I want you to do. So yeah, I'm going to be like, hey, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Be with him. As opposed to, oh, he's, you know, things got turned up a little bit. Now he's just completely denying anything about him. Yeah. Now, now Jesus isn't going to be all for saying, help him out, be with him. He's not saying, cast him into hell. He's just going to withdraw the, the help. Verse 34, think not. And another important verse. Yeah, I wish people would just read the Bible. I mean, week after week, Verse after verse, it's like, what is wrong with people? You get so screwed up and backwards into making up your own God and just believing weird things that aren't biblical at all just because you can't read your Bible and you let someone else do all the teaching and, and understanding for you and you just receive whatever it is that they say. Why don't you take it upon yourself to read the Bible? Why don't you start to figure out whether or not what you're being taught is actually real? You know, that's why we have the sermon notes on the back, the whole, the, all the back of the page here, so you can write down the things that we talk about, the things that we go over, the verses that we look at, and you can go and look them up when you get home and study them out and see, is this really what the Bible's saying? Because I don't expect any one of you to just believe what I'm saying, what the words coming out of my mouth, because I'm saying it, because I have the title, Pastor. The title doesn't mean anything. It's the Word of God that matters. And don't rely on, on some so-called man of God to just tell you everything the way it's going to be. Why don't you read the Bible for yourself? If you did, you could read verses like Matthew 10, 34, where Jesus Christ says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Amen. Oh, wait, but I guess you didn't read that verse, did you? 
For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes, a foe is an enemy, shall be they of his own household. So I didn't come to bring peace. You know what? There's going to be division over Jesus Christ, over him and what he's doing. I came to bring a sword. A sword divides. There's going to be those that want to stick with Jesus and there's going to be those that don't. And that's going to divide and split up families. Amen. Now, it's not, don't get me wrong and don't get Jesus wrong. It's not his desire to split up homes. He would have everybody to believe on him. But he doesn't want people backing down and not preaching his word. He doesn't want people censoring the message and just okay, well, I love you more than I love Jesus. He demands the love. That's why he says in verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So, you know, you think you're going to love them more than you're going to love me? Who died on the cross to pay for all of your sins and you're going you're to just love them more than you're going to love me? And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It's the words of Jesus. The truth divides. There's some people that love the truth and want to hear the truth, and there's other people that don't. They want to be told lies and be patted on the back and just told everything's good and be told peace, peace, when there is no peace. That's it. And they just want to walk away feeling like everything's just great and fine and dandy all the time, no matter what they've done, no matter what anybody does. But that's not truth. Verse 38, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Well, that doesn't sound very easy. It's not. But it's Christianity. It's what you're supposed to be doing. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He's teaching, you know what? You shouldn't even care about, you know, be, be so wrapped up in your own life. He's saying if, if, if you care more about your life than his and, and following him, he says, you're just going to lose it. And, and if that's the way that you view things, is that it's all just focused on you and your life. When you try to cling to those things, it's all just going to go away. You try to cling and get the riches of this world, it's going to be taken away from you and given unto someone else. He says, you're trying, trying to find your life, you're just going to lose it. But he that loseth his life for my sake, that person's going to have it. They're not worried about their own life and God's going to give them the very thing just because he's not, he's not worried about it, because he's not concerned. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only, in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. He closes out this, this chapter. I know he continues on in the next one, but he closes out this chapter. This chapter is closed out with Jesus Christ basically then commending the people who support the men of God that aren't going to back down. Why? Because the people who are standing up for the word of God, they're being persecuted, they're having you know, everything come against them, and he's saying, you receive them, you're going to get a reward. Don't turn your back on them. See, unfortunately, sometimes what the weak Christian will do is when you've got one guy in the spotlight, and they're being persecuted and they're being hammered and everyone's coming against them. And then you got family members going, oh man, that guy's crazy. That's your pastor? That's your, you know, you know that guy or whatever? Oh uh, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, he's kind of out there. He's kind of extreme. I don't, you know, you're not going to get any reward that way. Right. You're saying, but if you, but if you just stand with them and support them and show up to church and be like, I'm with you. I'm here with you. I'm supporting you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you a cup of water. I'm right there. That's what's going to get a reward. And, and that's not even doing very much. 
But you know what? It's very helpful for the person trying to stand and having done all to stand when the devil's casting his fiery darts and, and doing everything else. And that's what people who are actually making a stand need. They need people supporting them. Because it's not easy. Jesus has gone over multiple times that, that there's going to be all this coming. He said, don't be afraid. He didn't, just because he said, don't be afraid, he didn't say it's going to be easy. Yeah. Just don't be afraid. He wouldn't tell you not to be afraid if it wasn't something that might cause fear and might make you become afraid. He's saying, don't be afraid. Just, just keep your eyes on the right thing. Keep focused on, on the faith. Lots in this chapter. I know we went a little bit long tonight, but let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you uh, so much for all the great truths that are found in your word. I pray that you would please help us all as believers to um, take it upon ourselves to read, to read your words and to take them seriously and to read, read all of them and not to rely on other people to, to teach us the Bible, but that we would first and foremost just, just read for ourselves and judge other people on what, what they're teaching and what they're saying based on what your words really say, dear God. I pray that you would please give us wisdom and understanding and knowledge and help us to know what's right. Lord, help us to stand firm when trials and tribulations come our way. And um, God, we love you, and I pray that you would please just, just bless everyone here tonight. Help us all to, uh, to travel safely this evening when we go our separate ways. And Lord, uh, just help build our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.